Thank you for the opportunity to participate in these virtual collections tours. I'm excited to tell you about Harvard University's glass flowers and my colleague Scott Fulton will discuss conservation of the collection. The official name of the glass flowers is the Ware Collection of Glashka Glass Models of Plants. This one of a kind collection has educated students and the public, delighted visitors, and inspired artistic and scholarly works for more than a century. The glass flowers are on permanent exhibition at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, but they are part of the Harvard University Herbaria's collections. Professor George Lincoln Goodell was a botanist and the founding director of Harvard's Botanical Museum. He commissioned the glass flowers as a teaching collection that would also be a museum exhibit. Goodale was inspired by the displays of mounted animals in Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology, but creating a similar exhibit about botany was difficult because of how plants look when they are preserved. Mammals, birds, and other animals can look lifelike through taxidermy, but plant specimens are pressed and dried, then mounted on paper or barium sheets, or they are preserved in liquid. Godale wanted more exceptional scientific models than ones made from paper mache or wax. He also thought these materials would be susceptible to deterioration over time. Here you can see how effective the glass models are. And in this comparison between a living iris and the glass model on the right. While Goodale was planning exhibits for the Botanical Museum, he saw models of marine invertebrates made from glass on display in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. These glass models were made by Leopold Blaschka and his son Rudolf. Like plants, these soft-bodied animals lose their lifelike appearance when they are preserved, but the Blaschka's highly realistic glass models allow people to observe and study them as they appear in nature. Goodell thought the Blaschkas could use the same glass working techniques to produce equally realistic models of plants for the Botanical Museum. The Blaschkas glass working lineage is believed to trace back to 15th century Venice and their craft was passed down through multiple generations. Leopold learned glass working from his father and he also studied painting, jewelry making and metalworking. Rudolf started working with his father in 1870 when he was 13 years old, and he officially joined the business in 1876. The family lived in Bohemia, the area is now in the Czech Republic, and they moved to Dresden, Germany in 1863. Leopold first had the idea to imitate marine invertebrates in glass when he saw jellyfish while traveling to the United States in 1853. He made his first marine invertebrate models 10 years later after moving to Dresden. Museums and private collectors started ordering models from Leopold, and over the next two decades, the Blaschkas expanded their offerings to include hundreds of species. Godel visited the Blaschkas studio in 1886 to ask if they would make glass models of plants for the Botanical Museum. They were reluctant at first, but eventually agreed to the commission. The first shipment was damaged during a customs inspection in New York, but the broken models were promising and they were shown to potential supporters. Mary Lee Ware was one of Goodale's former students. She and her mother, Elizabeth C. Ware, provided funding to order more models. With support from the Wares, the Blaschkas divided their time between making invertebrate animal models for other institutions and plant models for Harvard. After three years, the Blaschkas wanted to focus on one type of work, and in April 1890, they signed a 10-year contract with Harvard to work exclusively on the glass flowers. They stopped making models for other institutions at this time. An agreement to make some models in 1886 turned into a 50 year long project. Leopold died in 1895 and Rudolf worked on the collection until his death in 1939. 
The final shipment of models was delivered in 1936. Over 50 years, the Blaschkas produced 4,300 models that represent 780 plant species. The glass flowers were made by Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka alone, and their productivity was so great that about 70% of the collection was completed when Leopold died in 1895. That's nine years that the Blaschkas worked on the collection together, and three of those years were only half time. The wares were devoted benefactors, and the collection is a gift in memory of Elizabeth's husband and Mary's father, Dr. Charles Elliot Ware. The Blaschkas used lamp working to make the models. This is a glass working technique in which glass is melted in a flame and shaped. Lamp working is also called flame working or torch working. The Blaschkas worked from direct observation and often drew the organisms they studied. Besides being beautiful and astonishingly realistic, the models are scientifically accurate, even in the fine details that can only be seen with magnification. The glass flowers proved to be an effective teaching collection and a popular museum exhibit. The collection has been displayed in the same gallery since the Botanical Museum opened in 1890. Changes and improvements were made to the exhibit over time, especially as there was a better understanding of how temperature, humidity, and light affect objects and artifacts. Part of the collection was displayed on the landing outside of the main gallery. These models were removed in October 2000 and put in storage. And this is the exhibit through the years. While changes and improvements were made to the exhibit, the model arrangement didn't change. The last time the models were arranged was in 1925. The first major renovation of the glass flowers exhibit occurred in 2016. The logistics of moving and storing these fragile objects was one of the challenges that prevented a large scale renovation from happening before then. There was a year and a half of planning before work started in the exhibit. During this time, a new storage facility and a conservation lab were set up, and Scott Fulton was hired as the collection's first full-time conservator. One of the goals for the renovation was to maintain the exhibit's character while making necessary updates. The exhibit was completely emptied for the first time in the museum's history. All object handling was done by me and Scott. The floor plan was redesigned. The old layout divided the room into three sections and the new floor plan is more open. Continuing to use the historic cases helped us maintain the exhibit's character. Most cases are over a hundred years old and all of them needed to be restored. Eight new cases were designed for changing exhibitions within the Glass Flowers Gallery. Having space to bring models out of storage for special exhibitions lets us show more of the collection and gives our visitors reasons to return. The models were rearranged according to the Angiosperm phylogeny group and all labels were redesigned and updated. The HVAC system was replaced and upgraded. Unstable environmental conditions have damaged the collection over time. Climate control is necessary for preservation because the models are sensitive to temperature and humidity fluctuations. A new LED lighting system was installed. The light levels in the exhibit are controlled to protect the models from light damage. Many other improvements were made. The exhibit was closed for only six and a half months. Several exciting projects have happened following the exhibit renovation, including the publication of Glass Flowers, Marbles of Art and Science at Harvard. The last photography book on the collection was published in 1982. The exhibit renovation was a big step forward in the care and maintenance of the collection. 
And none of this recent work would have been possible without our conservation program. I'm going to turn this presentation over to Scott Fulton, the head conservator, so he can talk about his work with the collection. Thank you, Jenny. As conservator for the Ware Collection, I'm pleased to share some of the hidden details that impact the condition of this amazing collection and its long-term care. At 4,300 individual models, the enormity of Harvard's Ware Collection of Blaschka glass models of plants is difficult to comprehend, particularly so because they were made by just two lamp workers. In scope, they represent the flora of the world with many representatives of economically important crops like apple, pear, peach, coffee, tea, and even cashew. The Blaschka's methods and the solutions to challenges that they face cannot be found in notebooks or ledger books. The best written sources of historical information that we have are the archived correspondence between Mary Ware, benefactor of the Blaschkas, and the museum directors of the Botanical Museum, George Goodale and Oakes Ames. One of her letters to Oakes Ames describes Rudolf Blaschka at his workbench during a visit to his Dresden studio on October 3rd, 1925. Mary Ware recounts seeing a work table strewn not only with his tools, but also with trays of glass leaves in the making, formed but not colored, she writes. One can imagine Mary Ware standing over Rudolph's shoulder as he worked, witnessing an array of glass stems and leaves at different stages of drying and cooling. She describes, quote, bottles with powdered glass ready as needed and saucers of the enamel paints, end quote. These historic letters and other correspondence from the Blaschkas provide a peek into their working lives and their business relationship with Harvard University's Botanical Museum. Our immediate source of information today comes from close observation of the models themselves and from selective analysis of sherds and fragments that have fallen off the models over time. Earlier studies of the glass flowers were done at Harvard's Fogg Museum of Art in 1992 by Nancy Buschini Lloyd and Rika Smith McNally. It was established then that the early Blaschka plant models made within the first 10 years of the 50 year, 50 year contract with Harvard employed a commercial alkali soda glass of silica, sodium, and a small amount of potassium. Following a routine shaped by lamp working traditions that came down to them through family. In recent years, work has been done at Harvard's Strauss Conservation Center to analyze very small leaf fragments and powdered residue from active glass corrosion in the models. This was to further characterize original glass composition and pinpoint possible causes of deterioration. Much of the Blaschka's methodology was based on their knowledge of jewelry making. They would start with metal wire armature, usually of copper for each model. Using wire of differing gauge, they strung sections of glass tubing like beads. The smaller parts, leaves, flowers, petals, and roots were anchored by very fine copper wires to heavier gauge base wires. Animal glue was then used to secure these parts prior to fusing them in place with powdered glass by the flame of a paraffin lamp. The Blaschkas likely obtained their raw materials locally near their studio and hometown of Hosterwitz near Dresden. Their, their glassware likely came from factories in nearby Bohemia, a region that was known historically for glass production. The colored glass enamels were melted down and prepared by Rudolf Blaschka in batches called cullet. Their pigments and colorants were primarily mineral pigments and metallic oxides. Recent analysis has revealed the use of organic binding media such as plant gums like 
gum arabic, and animal glue-based distemper to reduce the reflection of a, glass, a glossy surface. Their painting technique, as well as their choice of media, changed with each model to capture subtle variations of natural color, surface texture, and reflectance found in the plant itself. The Blaschkas were particularly adept at imparting a variety of natural matte appearances to mimic specific plant species. Matting and opacifying agents such as magnesium silicate or talc, tin oxide and barium sulfate have been identified in cross sections using microprobe analysis. The hairy surface of verbascum thapsus or mullendock was achieved with cotton fibers, probably blown as flocking onto the surface of leaf and stem while made sticky with a coating of, of animal glue. Raised surface details like venation on leaves, pubescence on stems or bark on branches were replicated with various raw materials common in their studio. A stem with thorns, like this model of Mechanella lineara, was possibly created by pricking the molten surface of the glass tube and pulling out the softened glass to a raised point, like toffee. Observation under ultraviolet light suggested that a protein glue coating was present by its distinctive fluorescence. Chemical and microscopic analyses of coatings and paint media went further to characterize the coatings and the adhesives. Matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, or MALDI, helped to pinpoint the unique origins of the animal glues that the Blaschkas used. Cow, sheep, goat, and horse have each been fingerprinted and found present in the, in the Blaschka glue pot. The Blaschka's choice of colorants and raw materials evolved between 1886 and 1936. They used a mixture of media that were available and traditional to lamp working practice. Cross-section analysis of samples from early glass models show an animal glue layer on the bare glass serving as a ground to support the paint layer above. On some models, the reaction of these proteinaceous glues in unstable gallery and storage environments led to peeling and lifting of paint in applied details. It seems likely that this problem presented itself early enough to inspire Rudolph to seek another, more stable approach to imparting color to his models. His experimentation with colored glasses ultimately transitioned into an enduring use of colored glass enamels in lieu of paint. By 1906, Rudolph had already begun modifying the composition of his glass enamels with compounds of lead and potassium so that he could achieve glass batches with lower melting points. Reducing these homemade enamels to a fine glass powder or frit and rendering them with heat over a base glass structure of higher melting point made it possible for him to enliven his palate. These innovative methods worked particularly well in mimicking the mottled appearance of natural foliage in his diseased fruit series. Rudolph's experimentation also introduced unforeseen conservation problems created by introducing lead into the chemistry of the glass. The results are visible in the models today as white spotting on the surface of leaves and fruit of his later models. The models affected with this white efflorescence can confuse the eye. It's easy to misinterpret the white deposits as the artist's intentional rendering of a fungal disease. For many years, this chemical manifestation went largely unnoticed. Left untreated, the glass becomes crizzled and fractured from the expansion of lead salt crystals, leading to losses of surface detail. About 64 models, most of them made between 1900 and 1936, are affected by this condition. Decades of seasonal changes in New England and exposure to an unstable indoor climate 
have compromised the condition of each model in the wear collection. Shrinkage and swelling of organic glues, coatings, and paint have caused delamination where the paint has lifted away from the glass. The tactile strength of an animal glue coating contracting in dry conditions can cause the thin glass itself to be pulled apart by the stress. On some models, sections of glass are cracked or missing entirely at the juncture of stems and branches. These models have succumbed to years of subtle flexing and vibration caused by nearby foot traffic. Thus exposed, the underlying copper wire can corrode and lead to further loss of glass. As the conservator, I routinely consolidate these damaged areas with a re reversible adhesive. The lost section of glass is then filled by brush with a viscous slurry of the same adhesive pigmented to match the surrounding area. It sometimes happens that leaves and flower petals lose their grip and spontaneously drop off when old glue joints fail. Likewise, glass flower parts that were insufficiently annealed can fracture along invisible crack lines. Over the years, this has led to the permanent loss of details, small and large. A novel method developed by glass conservators, Stephen Koob and Astrid Van Giffen at the Corning Museum of Glass is to use Perloid B72 to fill gaps and compensate losses in glass objects. This technique proved to be very useful in the treatment of pitcher plant, easily the largest model in the wear collection. The procedure involved molding and casting a thin sheet of Perloid B72 and tracing a reversible cutout to replace the missing section of glass. Japanese papers have also been used to selectively fill smaller voids or as a reinforcing repair material. The task of cleaning models is a delicate undertaking Again, and usually approach from the outside in with a soft artist brush and cosmetic sponge. Reaching the interior leaves and blossoms can be a frightening experience, but can be done with the cosmetic sponge and long tweezers. Compressed air in a can used carefully has its place as well. The models are affected by a very fine accumulation of black soot that permeated the cases during the years when cold burning furnaces were the norm. Selective cleaning with a nonpolar solvent can be effective in removing the oily soot without disturbing the water and alcohol sensitive paints and coatings under the grime. In 1895, George Lincoln Goodale, director of the Botanical Museum, was inspired to assess the condition of the Blaschka's work when nearly 70% of the wear collection was completed. He wrote that in no case has there been observed the slightest change in color of the pigments or in the character of the surface by exposure to light. It may be assumed therefore that these models possess a high degree of permanence under ordinary museum conditions. They are a valuable record of form, color and texture for future comparison, end quote. The conditions we find in the wear collection today cannot be described in those same words used by Dr. Goodale in 1895. Change and deterioration is inevitable as it is with all materials as they age. However, the Harvard glass flowers are remarkably well preserved for their age and exposure. Upholding the best practices of conservation and preservation planning will ensure that visitors to the glass flowers will continue to experience this wonderful confusion of glass with real for many years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>